So chapter 12, the nervous system, and as usual, the outcomes. This is what we're going to be learning. Most importantly, um, uh, the, uh, the cell itself, the neuron cell, and the, the, the nervous system, the details of the nervous system, and action potential is extremely important. We will discuss all these details. So nervous system consists of um, this part right here, which is the central nervous system, the nervous system in the center of the body, brain and spinal cord. And then there are nerves going out of it. We call that the peripheral nervous system. Um, the peripheral nervous system is the wiring that's connecting the central nervous system to the outside. What do we mean by outside? I mean receptors. So there is a connection between receptors outside and the central nervous system. These nerves are taking the signal from the receptors. I touch something here. So the nerves will take it from the receptor and take it all the way to the central nervous system. So it's going towards the nervous system, bringing sensation to the nervous system. And then the nervous, the central nervous system, I mean. The central nervous system is a control center. This is what's going to analyze and uh, decide what should be done and then the other nerve will go and do this uh, order. So there is one nerve, one wire, one nerve that take the sensation from the receptors to the central nervous system. You make a decision, you send an order, which we call it a motor command, and this will go to the effector. And the effector in this case, it can be a muscle, it can be a gland. I'll give you an example practical example let me say i'm touching something and this was hot between touching it and moving this is a whole process touch receptor got this sensation it's hot a nerve take it from the receptors to the to the central nervous system accessing and that's called afferent accessing afferent nerve Okay, and it's carrying sensation. We also call it sensory. So what is this one from here to here? From receptor to the central nervous system, afferent, sensory. Okay, now the sensation go to the central nervous system. I got this signal that's hot. I analyze the signal. Of course, it's milliseconds. We're talking about milliseconds. Analyze the signal. I decided to move away, right? Otherwise, I'm going to harm myself. So I decided to move away. What's going to happen? A nerve will take that motor command from my central nervous system to the muscles. This nerve from the central nervous system to the muscle will exit the spinal cord or the central nervous system. Exit with E. So we call it efferent. E. Efferent. Or motor. It go to the muscles. What do we call the muscles? Effector. The muscle contract, I move away. So just touching and moving away, you're going through all of this. Receptor, afferent or sensory, control center, which is the central nervous system, efferent or motor nerve, effector, muscle. You go through all of this, just touch, move. But you have to go through all of this. Starting the, the receptor um, to the control center until you go out to the effector, it can be a muscle, it can be a gland. We will discuss the details, but this is just an introduction to the different parts. Now we have two types of cells in the nervous system. The, the actual nerve cell, the one that does the conduction, the one that carry the signal, this is called neuron. And the details of this neuron is very important lecture and lab. You will see the models, different models for the neurons in the lab. And this is the actual one. But there are other cells that are called neuroglia or glial cells. These cells are kind of helpers, supporters. They help, they support the neurons. They feed them, they protect them, they repair them. So here are the divisions, anatomical divisions. 
central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Remember, th there are different ways to divide the nervous system and you should be aware of this for the lecture and for the lab, both of them. Anatomical is anatomy. Where is it? Where is it? But the functional classification or, or the physiological classification is what do you do? What's your function? Clear? Anatomy, where are you? Physiology, what do you do? So if I ask you about the anatomical uh, divisions, where is it? In the center, central nervous system. At the periphery, peripheral nervous system. What do you do is something else. Are you carrying sensation or are you car carrying a motor command? So central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. And this is the, the, the processing center. This is uh, the control center. It receives information and make motor commands. This is what, what the job is. But let me tell you from the beginning, because this is an introduction, the whole central nervous system is managing the body. Okay? but different levels. The lowest level is the spinal cord. Brain is higher than the spinal cord. The cortex, the cover of the brain is the highest of all. Okay, so this is like supervisor, manager, and president. All of this is management, right? Spinal cord is this is like a supervisor. This is supervising everything above it higher level. That's the brain The cover of the brain is the highest of all and this is our conscious the highest functions We will discuss the details. So all of that is the central nervous system Anything outside of that obviously central nervous system brain inside the skull and the spinal cord inside the vertebral column if you guys remember the bone anything outside of that is part of the peripheral nervous system and for the still anatomical classification are you talking about peripheral nervous system connected to the brain or peripheral nervous system connected to the spinal cord this is anatomical right so we always do the two ways of classifying anatomical and physiological or functional all right anatomical location where are you uh, connected to the brain i would call you cranial nerves if you're connecting to uh, connected to the spinal cord i'll call you spinal nerves so these are the anatomical classifications of the peripheral nervous system okay what do you do this is something else are you carrying sensation sensory are you carrying a motor command motor so these are the different ways of classifying. If you get a question, make sure that you understand the question. You're asking me about the classification. No, what part? Are you talking about anatomical or physiological? So um, functional or physiological classification, this is a functional now. Now it's not about location. It's not about where are you, like central or peripheral. This is location, this is anatomy. Now what do you do are you carrying sensation this is your function is to carry sensation from the periphery from the receptors bringing it to the central nervous system or are you carrying a motor command from the central nervous system to the effector outside this is what you do and this is a function so afferent is the sensory one afferent to remember it a go like accessing going in to the central nervous system. E, exit efferent. This is the one that goes out from the central nervous system to the effector. And this is the motor one. And it goes to the muscles or glands. The afferent come from receptors. Receptors and effectors, this is what I just talked about. The receptors are the one that receive the signal. Effector is what is going to do the motor command. Can be a muscle, can be a gland. Are we following so far? Because we're going in more, we're going deeper. So afferent, afferent, is that sensory or motor? 
sensory efferent. Okay, so now the motor itself. We're going even deeper. So efferent is motor. Motor to what? Are you motor to the muscles, skeletal muscles? We call that somatic motor. Or are you motor to the viscera? What's the viscera? The viscera is anything that's involuntary. Anything inside this. Anything that's involuntary. What, what is voluntary? Muscles, right? Your skeletal muscles are voluntary. Anything else is involuntary, and this will be called autonomic nervous system. So this is subclassification. It's not only afferent and efferent. Okay? Efferent. Okay, efferent means your motor. Yes, motor to what? This is going uh, into subclassification. Are you motor to the skeletal muscles? Or are you motor to anything else that's, in, uh, that, that's involuntary or subconscious? If you're motor to the skeletal uh, muscles, I will call you somatic nervous system. Uh, if you're going to the viscera, and viscera means organs. If you're going to the organs, involuntary. Anything that's involuntary, anything that's unconscious or unconscious or subconscious. This is called autonomic and it's coming from autonomy. Autonomy or auto, uh, automatic. This is something that's working alone. You don't think about it. You do not uh, speed up your heart. You do not decide to speed up your heart, slow down your heart. You do, you do not decide to stop. You do not decide to contract your, your inner muscles like of the stomach or intestine, right? You don't choose to do any of this. If you're sleeping, still everything is going on and this is working in autonomy. We call it autonomic nervous system. Good so far? Autonomic itself is subdivided into two different levels or two different sub-sub-classification. What is it? Okay, so we're talking about the one that's autonomic, autonomy. It's working on its own. You're sleeping, it's still working. Autonomy. This one is divided into two subclassifications depending on the situation. If, if the situation is fight, fright, flight, you're fighting. What will be turned on and what will be turned off? Versus rest, digest. Fight, fright, flight versus rest, digest. These are two opposite uh, situations, right? If you're fighting or you're frightened, frightened or uh, you're going to flee because there is a dangerous situation or something, that's called sympathetic. It's part of the autonomic. The other one, which is rest, digest. Rest, digest is just describing this situation why there is nothing like um, uh, nothing, nothing dangerous. You're nothing. You're not frightened or something. There is everything is okay. I'm just relaxing or eating. So what kicks in if you are in this situation versus this situation? Obviously, you can actually figure it out on your own, but we will do it later. But just think about it simply. Like if if you're fighting, right, and you have no idea about this, you can just guess it. What do you think happened to your heart, for example? Does your heart speed up or slow down if you're fighting? Speed up, of course. What do you think about your blood pressure? Goes up or goes down? Up. What do you think about respiration? Do you speed up or slow down? Speed up, right? It's, it's just common sense. Which is the opposite of the parasympathetic, but we will discuss the details later on. Now, they put sympathetic and parasympathetic as the two subdivisions for the autonomic, but they found an, another category and they put it alone. It's not really sympathetic, not really parasympathetic. It's a separate system, local system. And this is only inside our viscera. And we call that enteric nervous system. And this is a separate system that's only in our digestive tract and it's working alone. Okay, it's not really um, something that's well coordinated. It's working under the spinal cord alone. That just the spinal cord take care of it. The supervisor take care of it. Like this, like the food is in, in this part of my intestine. And there is nothing much to think about. 
So it, I want to move it from here to here. Just relax this part and push it. So does, this doesn't need my brain to think about it. Just the spinal cord will manage it. And we call that uh, enteric nervous system. So it's a third category. Sympathetic and parasympathetic, yes, this is the main ones. And this is coordinated by the brain and the spinal cord. But there is a separate local system, just in a digestive tract, supervised by the, the spinal cord and coordinated by the spinal cord alone. And this is called enteric nervous system, even though it's under the influence of the autonomic nervous system, meaning leave it alone, it's work alone. But do I have a say on it, like autonomic nervous system? Can I like, I'm not going to start it and stop it, but can I like speed it up a little bit? Yes, this is under the influence of the autonomic nervous system. So here it is, if you look at this, these are all the classifications. Uh, there is an afferent, and this is an efferent, and this is information processing. Information processing in the central nervous system. Anything else? Peripheral nervous system. Afferent is sensory. Efferent is motor. Motor to what? Skeletal muscles, somatic. Anything else? Subconscious or involuntary? This is autonomic and can be sympathetic, parasympathetic, but there is an enteric as well. Also for the afferent, we're going to subclassify it, same way. Did you get the efferent? You're sending a motor command to what? Skeletal muscles or something involuntary? This is somatic and, and autonomic. How about you can tell me where are you bringing the information from? This is a subclassification. Are you getting this information from the skeletal muscles, the joints, the skin? Um, I call this somatic. Or are you bringing sensation from the visceral, from the, 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 the organs? We call that visceral sensory. Or are you coming from the special sensory organs? What are the special sensory organs? What are the special, sens special sensations that you have? Hearing, smell, vision, right? That's three. Uh, taste, that's four. Not touch. The fifth one is what we always forget. Is what? Balance, yes. Balance or equilibrium. This is the fifth one. Okay? So those five are a special sensory organ. If it's not one of those five, now either it is somatic or autonomic. Or visceral, I mean. Visceral, you're coming from the visceral. Sensation from your stomach, from your intestine, from your heart, from your bladder, from anything that's involuntary. We call that visceral sensory versus somatic sensory. Somatic sensory come from here. Muscles, joints, skin, we call that somatic. So it's all having a uh, subclassification. Now the neuron itself. The neuron is the actual nerve cell, okay? And this is the basic functional unit and it consists of different parts and this is very important. I might give you a picture in the exam. I usually don't use much pictures but I wanted to emphasize that you know everything in this. So I might use, I, I don't remember which version I'm going to use, but most likely you're going to see this. Uh, um, I will show you the picture. Uh, I think that will be better. Look at this picture right here. This blue here is the body. And then you will see tiny branching, several ones. We call those dendritis, dendritis. And then one long extension going all the way, and we call that the axon. So you have many short branches and one long branch. The many short branches are called the dendritis. And this is the entrance towards the neuron. The axon, which is one that's going out, this is the exit. This is where you're leaving the neuron. Okay? So... The body itself contains nucleus and the cytoplasm around it, instead of call it, calling it cytoplasm, we call it pericarium. Why did you call it pericarium? Peri means around. Carion is referring to the nucleus. 
So pericardium is around the nucleus. It is the cytoplasm, but this is what they call it, pericardium. And there are different organelles, just like any other neuron. You guys remember the uh, uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lice, all that stuff. We still have the same thing here, uh, but there are minor differences, and I will talk about this. Here is the axon, this long. At the end, it's going to branch. We call that telodendria. Uh, does it, the second part of the name, kind of sound similar to this? Dendritis? Yes, these are dendritis. These are telodendria. Dendritis are branches. Telodendria are also branches, but it's far away from, from the body. And this is what telo means. So dendritis branches from the body. Telodendria are dendria, which is branches, away from the body because it is at the end of the axons. So this is for this picture right here. Body, carrion, pericarion, dendritis, axon, telodendria, until at the end here, these are called the synaptic knobs. Do you guys remember synaptic knobs, synaptic terminals, from which acetylcholine will leave, cross the gap? Do you remember this? Calcium and all that stuff, yes. So these are uh, uh, the, um, the synaptic terminals. So going back, here is the neuron again. And here it is. There is a big nucleus containing nucleolus. The cytoplasm is called pericardium. We still have the mitochondria, and we have ribos uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum with ribosomes, but here there will be a very important difference. Remember, in the, in the normal cells, it's either smooth in the plasmic reticulum without ribosomes or rough with ribosomes, right? Here we have another thing, unique. There are rough in the plasmic reticulum and a lot of aggregates of ribosomes beside it, not, not just stuck on the surface, beside it. And we call that collectively rough ER plus the, 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 the aggregates of ribosomes beside it we call that nestle bodies. This is something unique. Is nestle bodies the same as rough endoplasmic reticulum? Kind of. It's just a little bit different. It is rough endoplasmic reticulum, but there is also extra aggregations of ribosomes. It's coming. You will see it, but it's called the nestle bodies. And actually, the nestle bodies will give the neurons their natural color, which is gray. And you will see that coming gray color because of this nissel body. If you remember the cytoskeleton when we talked about it in the, in the cells, uh, and instead of saying, do you guys remember the microtubules and the microfilaments? Same thing, but instead of saying micro, you say neuro. Otherwise, it's the same thing. Neurofilaments, neurotubules, neurofibrils. Here are the nissel bodies I talked about. It's dense area of rough ER plus aggregations of ribosomes. It is not exactly the same as a rough ER. It's, it contains something extra, extra aggregations of ribosomes. And again, this is what's going to give our neurons their natural color, which is gray. It will make sense later on. Dendritis, these are the dendritis that have spines. And again, this is the entrance to the neuron. The axon is that long extension that will propagate out dendritis entrance you go into axon out the cytoplasm inside this axon specifically the inside of it is called axoplasm not cytoplasm because practically speaking it's not inside the the, the cell itself it's inside the extension so we call that axoplasm The membrane here is called axolemma. If you guys remember from the, the past unit, do you remember sarcolemma, which is a membrane of the muscle? Same thing here, but we call it axolemma, axolemma. And little bit more details in this picture here. And, and most likely, 
uh, I prefer this picture. So you need to know this picture in detail. I might use it in the exam. If not, I will describe it and you will need to know it anyway. So this is extremely important. It's basics. The bottom line, the core of the chapter. So what do we see here? This is the body. Nucleus is inside and nucleolus is inside the nucleus. Outside of it is the pericardium, which is between the nucleus and uh, the membrane. And here you see the nestle bodies. You see these rough AR? You see extra aggregations? Can you see that or not? Look at these aggregations. There are extra aggregations here. And that's why we call it the nestle bodies. Look at this mitochondria. And you will see everything else. Like here, you will see the microtubules and the microfilaments and so on. But the axon itself is further subdivided into parts. The first part here is the axon hillock. What's axon hillock? Hillock means attachment. Axon hillock is the attachment of the axon to the body. Followed by initial segment, the very first part of the axon. Then the axon itself, and then it's going to divide into telodendria. Actually, it's divide into like two first, and then go to the telodendria. At the end of the telodendria, there are the axon terminals, also known as uh, synaptic nubs. Terminals, same as nubs. This is where these vesicles containing acetylcholine, if you still remember, it's over there. And the purple that you see here, this is the next neuron. Because most of the time, it's not one huge neuron that's taking all this distance. It's neuron after neuron after neuron after neuron. This is how it goes. Okay? But here is the direction. Dendritis is the entrance to the body, to the axon, to the branches, telodendria, synaptic knobs or terminals. Gap, dendritis, body, axon, and so on. Until the end, and then another dendritis, another body, and so on. One after one after one. And notice that it goes in one direction only. You go dendritis, body, hillock, axon, um, uh, um, initial segment, axon, and so on. It goes in this way only. It doesn't go backward. The action potential or the electrical signal move unidirectionally, moving this way only. And it doesn't go the other way around or the opposite. Uh, the axon is going to divide into collaterals, and then collaterals give you the telodendria, and then axon terminals, synaptic terminals, synaptic knobs. All are the same, and you need to remember this. Axon terminals, synaptic terminals, synaptic knobs, same thing. How are you going to move like this? From the body to the axon hillock, to the initial segment, to the axon, you're going in this way. This is called axonal transport or axoplasmic transport. This is how things are going to move within the, the axon. And this is going to be powered by the mitochondria. There is a lot of mitochondria in the axons to help things to move on one way. And there is something called um, uh, kinesine and dynine. Um, it, it is just it's moving on on this way anyway now the neuron itself the one that i showed you with all these dendritis and one axon this is the most common one not the only type the most common type okay there are other varieties but again this is the one that we focus on this is the one that we use in the lab and this is the most common one but you do need to know the other ones that are a little bit different uh let me show you these pictures that will make more sense and for these pictures you need to know i will ask you what does it mean and give me examples where so you should know this this one right here the first one an exon an ax uh, axonic what's an means without do you see any action here or all of them are the same 
right? There is no accent. So this is called anexonic. How about this? There are two pools. What do you mean by pool? A pool is an extension from the body, and normally we have multi pools. Look at this. If you have a circle like this, there are no pools. But if you do this, this is one pool. Two. Now it's three. Okay? This is multi -pooler. See the pool? Then you extend. So this is multi -pooler. Look at this. What do you think? Bipolar, right? How about this? this? Unipolar or monopolar, right? Unipolar. So it's all it's all about is it a circle like this, which doesn't happen, or you have one pool, unipolar, you have two, bipolar, or more multipolar. Okay? So the first type is anaxonic. There's no accent. What if if you have an accent? It all depends. Look at this one. How many pools do you see here? So this is called bipolar. So one of them is a long dendritus that will end with the branches. And instead of coming directly from the body, there is, a, there is a long one here. And another long one here that's called the axon that end with the axon terminal. This is for the bipolar. The next one is, un, is unipolar. You might say here, uh, no, there are two. Here is one and here is one, right? No, what's the pool? How many pools do you see here? It's one. I know it's going to branch, but coming out of the body, how many pools? Just one. So this is multipolar. It is going to divide into two accents. One of them will be, will have the dendritus, and the other one will have the accent terminals. It's kind of very similar to this one, except this one comes from two pools. This one comes from one pool only. Last one is the multipolar, and this is our focus. You see how many pools? <coughs> Thank you. So look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six pools. So this is multipolar. And this is the one that we're going to stick with. So this is just explaining what does it mean. But you do need to know where is it. Anaxonic, this is in the brain and the special sensory organs. You do need to know location. How about the bipolar? The bipolar is the one that's in, in the special sensory organs only. Okay? And this is very rare. Unipolar, this is most sensory neurons are unipolar. We know the sensory neurons, right? Is that afferent or efferent? Sensory. Afferent. So most of it is here. Most sensory neurons are unipolar. Multipolar, this is everywhere. Okay? Uh, this is the most common one all over in the central nervous system and even in the, uh, the, the motor neurons. So the whole central nervous system and the whole motor. So what's left? Sensory, right? Sensory is mostly unipolar. The other two are exceptions. Here is the anaxonic. What is this? Uni or bi or anaxonic or multi? Bi and this? Uni and this? Multipolar. Okay. Now, uh, the, the neurons are, classifi are classified from the functional point of view is what do you do? What's your function? Do you carry sensation? That's your function. Or you carry a motor command? Sensory and motor. Afferent and efferent. How about the interneuron? What's, what is this third one? There is most, it's not, it's not both. It's one, most of the time, one in between those two. Like this is sensory, taking the sensation from the receptor to the central nervous system, okay? 
and the motor from the central nervous system to the effector. Is that clear? Yes. A lot of times there is one in between. Like she is giving is getting information and she is taking the motor command, right? They just go together like this. You take the sensor information, give it to her, and she take the motor command and give it out. If I stand in between them, I will say, okay, not directly. Give it to me, I'll give it to her. This is called the interneuron, and this is inside the central nervous system. It's not all the time. Sometimes it is there. Sometimes it's not there. So sensory is the afferent, and uh, it's subdivided into somatic and visceral, and I talked about this. It's all depend on where are you bringing the sensation from, from the viscera or from skin, muscles, and joints. Sensory neurons are, are unipolar. So it goes like this. These are the receptors. Okay? And here is the afferent or sensory. Okay? And this is the central nervous system. Okay? When it gets closer, here is the unipolar. Isn't that unipolar? See this pole? So it goes like this. Receptors, it's moving. It's moving. This is the body here. It's unipolar. And then it's enter M. Practically speaking, it's arranged like this. Here is another one. And here is the body. And here is the third one. And here is the body. This is how it actually it looks like this. So do you see these bodies beside each other like this? Yes, the neurons are, are like this. And we cover it and we call that ganglion. Ganglion. Okay? Very important. Ganglion. What's a ganglion? Aggregation of cell bodies. Okay, this is called the dorsal root ganglion or the sensory ganglion, and you will see it coming again, but just understand what does it mean? What's a ganglion? It's a group of cell bodies. Here it is in the sens sensory ones of the unipolars. Now receptors. There are two basic types of receptors. Are you monitoring the outside of the body or are you monitoring the inside of the body? If you're monitoring the outside of the body, we call that exterior. Exterior. We know exterior is outside, right? Exterior receptors versus interior. Exterior, interior, like exterior and interior. These are the two types, but they also put a third category. They used to, to, to put it together with the, with, with the interior, but now they put it alone. Uh, these proprioceptors, these are receptors inside the joints, mainly. Also in, inside uh, the, the, the ligaments and muscles, okay? And these are, this is a special type. Uh, are you monitoring the inside or the outside? It's not really the outside because it's inside your body, right? But it's not also the viscera. Your non, what's the viscera? You know the viscera, right? All the organs, heart, lung, intestine, urinary tract, anything. These are called viscera, right? So what are you monitoring? None of those. Not the outside and not the viscera inside. So what are you monitoring? The joints and the muscles and the ligaments. So this is basically proprioceptors are monitoring position. The position. We call it proprioceptors. Clear? Like this. I'm going to close my eyes and I can tell you exactly that I'm extended. It's about 90 degree, acute angle, fuse angle. How do they know? Proprioceptors inside will tell me the exact position, okay, of my joints. If you close your eye and move, you can tell me without looking. Proprioceptor. Motor, on the other hand, uh, you're, you're carrying motor command. So this is efferent. And you either take it to the skeletal muscles. I call you somatic and I talked about this. Or are you taking it to the viscera? I will call you visceral motor the motor one motor is afferent or efferent efferent right 
and you're you're carrying motor command, right? Okay, they notice this. Starting from the central nervous system, it's not one nerve that takes the motor command from the central nervous system to the organ. It's not one nerve. One start and stop, and from there there is another one. What, what is this in between? This is like you take uh, like the aeroplane from here to London and from London to Japan. So what's London now? Where you stop and start again. Here it's called a ganglion. Uh, you told us about the, the ganglion. Yes, this is another one. Okay. The other, the, the one that I talked about, which is this. This is the sensory ganglion. A collection of cell bodies in the sensory part. This is another ganglion that's called autonomic ganglion. Okay, what's autonomic ganglion? One nerve takes the motor command from the central nervous system to the ganglion and stop. And another one takes it from there to the organ. From here to London, from London to Japan, to Tokyo, for example. Okay, so this, when you stop, change, and start again, this is called a ganglion. So because of that, from here to London, this is before you go, right? So we call it pre-ganglionic, before the ganglia. Pre means before. And then from London to Tokyo, this is after, right? So we call it post-ganglionic, okay? So the fibers that take it from the central nervous system to the ganglion, pre-ganglionic, the fibers that take it from the ganglion to the organ is post-ganglionic. Interneuron is what I talked about. And this is the one that's located in between those two. And enter, I think we talked about this before. Enter means in between. I mentioned it several times, right? Enter. It's not intra. Enter, in between. So enter neuron, it's in between those two. Between the sensory and motor. You take the sensation from the sensory. There is no connection from the sensory to the motor. Sensory end, give the information to the enter neuron. And then the enter neuron sends the motor command to the motor one. Is that clear? So you are in between those two. You're not, you guys are not communicating. Just give me the sensation and I will give him the order. W why are you doing that? Because if it goes directly like this, you have no say on it, right? Sensory, motor. Touch, move away. That's it. But a lot of things, you need to have a say on it. You have to, you, you, you need to have an opinion. You need to decide what to do. It's not just happening automatically, right? So you have an interneuron in between, and this one is not simply going to take the information from this and, hand, and handle the motor command to this. No, that's not enough. It will also let the central nervous system know what's, what's happening. Don't you keep a memory of, of when you do something like if I touch something for the very first time, and I noticed this is hot, okay? I didn't know before. Next time when you see it, don't you remember that it was hot? How did you remember? If it goes from this to this, that's it. You will not remember. But because of the interneuron, you are going to remember. Another thing is learning and planning. When you get something, you think about it and you decide. Example, I, uh, I'm crossing the street and I see cars, right? So sensation will go from the eye to my central nervous system. Cars are moving, okay? Now there is an interneuron that will send the signal to the brain. Uh, we're crossing and there are cars. What should we do? Okay, so it's giving the information to the brain. The brain will say, don't go now. Wait, right? So you are not doing anything. Now it's clear. Now I'm going to send a signal to the motor command, go. So there is in between uh, this uh, coordination in between, and this is the interneuron. Also for the learning, like if you play piano, for example, right? You play piano for the first time, it's hard. Second time, 10 times, 50 times. Doesn't it get like easier and easier? Interneuron. Now the neuroglia. Neuroglia are the supporters and protectors of the neuron. And we have different types that we need to know. And here are the different types. And 
I can simply say, you will have a question in each one of those. Okay? These, these are about six types, six questions. Clear? Six questions here. For each one of those, I, know, I want you to know certain things. I know that all six are supporters. All of these are helpers. Yes, what kind of help? Okay, so for each one of those, you need to tell me what does it do. So starting with uh, the neuroglia in the central nervous system. Some of them are in the central and some of them are in the peripheral. Four in the center. What are these? Number one, microglia. Microglia, it sounds like microphage. Microglia, microphage. These are the eaters. They clean the area. They eat anything that's not supposed to be there. Waste product, remnants, microglia. This is the first one. And is that in the central nervous system or peripheral? Central. We're talking about central now. There are only two in the peripheral. I will talk about it. But for now, we're talking about the central. Number two, there is something called oligodendrocytes. What do I want you to know about the oligodendrocytes? I know the name is kind of hard. You have to know it. Oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes. What's oligodendrocytes for? Myelination of the central nervous system. What's myelination? Myelin sheath. Yes. Do you guys remember the natural color of the neuron? Gray. Why? Why is it gray? What do we have inside of it that give it the gray color? Uh, what, what, there is a name for it. Nestle, nestle bodies. Yes, nestle bodies. Okay. This is a natural color. Uh, is it all like naked like this? Like this is my natural color right here. But I'm wearing a shirt, right? So if you look here, it's blue, right? So the natural color, like the natural color of the skin, the natural color of the neuron is gray because of the nestle bodies. But is it always like this, uncovered? It's all, no, it's actually most of the time it is covered. And this cover is white in color. We call it the myelin sheath. This myelin is white. Meaning, if this neuron is covered, it is white. If it is not covered, it's gray. Okay? We call it myelinated unmyelinated. Instead of covered uncovered, because it's covered with myelin. So we call it myelinated unmyelinated. Myelinated, what's the color? Myelinated. White. Unmyelinated gray because this will bring us later to white matter and gray matter it's coming but who is responsible for making that myelin in the central nervous system only oligodendrocytes there is another one for the peripheral nervous system both of them do the same job both of them do the myelination yes but where so you can't say like oligodendrocytes what's the function myelination that's not enough myelination wave central nervous system because there is another one does the same job in the peripheral it's called schwann cells it's coming okay next ependymal cells ependymal cells lining the ventricles the central canal of the spinal cord it's responsible for producing and circulating csf you have to know this ependymal cells what are the ependymal cells this is the lining of uh, the ventricles, I know that you, you guys don't know the ventricles yet, we didn't talk about it, and the central canal of the spinal cord, what is this? We will learn later that inside your brain there are some spaces, it's not like all compact like this, okay, it's not the whole thing, it's just brain cells, brain cells, no, there are some cavities. These cavities are the ones that make the cerebrospinal fluid, are we familiar with the cerebrospinal fluid, that's fluid inside our brain? There is fluid inside our brain. Where do we make it? In these cavities called ventricles. This is in the brain. How about the spinal cord? Does it also have a cavity? It's not a cavity, it's a canal. So lining both of those is ependymal cells. Uh, you're lining those to do what? To make the CSF. Very important. Make and monitor CSF. If there is one word, that you should remember, which is not enough, but this is the minimum, CSF. You hear ependymal cells, CSF. 
okay? Where ventricles and uh, central canal. Last one is astrocytes. Astrocytes are most important thing about it is this. What is this? What is it? What is this? What is the whole thing here? The, all these aggregations of cell bodies. Ganglion, yeah. It's called ganglion, right? This ganglion, what makes it ganglion and surround it are the astrocytes. Okay? So if there is one thing that you, you that you remember about these ganglion, astrocytes, ganglion, and maintenance of the blood-brain barrier. Okay, the third one is injury, uh, uh, repairing injury. Okay, blood-brain barrier. This is one. Uh, ganglion. This is one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I take it back. I'm sorry. These, these are the uh, satellite cells. I'm sorry. These are the satellite cells. I'll take it back. Astrocytes are blood brain barrier plus uh, repair. Blood brain barrier and repair. So, okay, one more time. Just uh, adjust um, satellite cells, is what I was talking about. But, uh, but astrocytes here are BBB blood brain barrier okay if there is one word to remember it's bbb one word to, to remember about the ependymal cells csf clear ependymal cells csf you cannot forget this uh astrocytes bbb blood brain barrier there is a barrier between the blood and the brain because you cannot let everything in the blood go to the brain the brain is extremely sensitive so you have to have this barrier in between plus repairing so what i what i just mentioned is enough to know for this part and impendimal cells oligodendrocytes okay microglia Peripheral nervous system. I already told you what you have in the central nervous system. Uh, is that enough to know? Yes. Okay. What I told you is enough to know. Just memorize it. Remember it. These are the basics. If you wanted to expand a little bit more and read, that's okay. But what I told you, you cannot forget it. How about this, the peripheral nervous system? What do we have there? What are the neuroglia of the peripheral nervous system? We have two things. Satellite cells, and this is what I was talking about. Uh, this is what's surrounding the cell bodies of the ganglia. These are satellite cells surrounding the ganglion, okay? Uh, and regulating oxygen and carbon dioxide and nutrients at the same time, okay? What's, what's, if, what if I forgot it? What I cannot forget? Ganglion. I'm giving you one word here, right? CSF, BBB, ganglion. Phages, eaters. I'm giving you one word. It's it's not enough, but this is the minimum. Okay, satellite cells surrounding the, the ganglia. Ganglion. This is the most important one. It does regulate oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nutrients, but this is the most important one. How about one cell? This is oligodendrocytes sister. Oligodendrocytes. What does it do? One word. Myelin. Myelin. How about this, Schwann cells? Myelin. What's the difference? Oligodendrocytes, myelin, central nervous system. It myelinates the neuron, central nervous system. How about Schwann cells? Peripheral nervous system. Clear? Can you remember one word about it? Oligodendrocytes, myelin. CSF. Okay? Microglia, microphages, the eaters. Okay? Ependymal cells, CSF, right? It lined the ventricles in the central canal? Yes. Astrocytes, ganglion. Schwann cells, myelin, but peripheral. Satellite cells, ganglion, okay? 
you need to know more than that, but I'm just giving you one word to remember. This would be the minimum that you cannot forget. The outer surface of the Schwann self, what, what, what the function of the Schwann self? Myelination, peripheral or, or, or central? Peripheral. The, the, the surface, the, uh, the, uh, the, the outer surface of these one cells will make neural lemma. What's a neural lemma? Lemma is membrane, like a membrane. This is, it makes, it's part of the membrane of the neuron. Look at this. This is a body. This is the axon hillock. This is the initial segment. And starting from this all the way down, this is the axon, right? This is the axon. And look at these. Can you see this like uh, golden color, orange color? And you see something in it here? This, these are Schwann cells making the axon lemma. And the, the actual white, can you see these like layer after layer after layer? Can you see this? This is the myelin. Uh, the myelin, it's not like a shirt like this covering the whole thing. No. It's patches. Okay? Myelin. And then you leave a little space, just a, a tiny spot, and then myelin. You put a patch, and you leave a small spot. Patch, small spot. Patch. It, so it goes in patches like this. And there is a reason for that. Why it's not like this? Like a whole sheet covering the whole thing. No, it's not like that. It's patches, 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 patches. Why? Because... In between, you're leaving axon. Do you see the axon, the blue in between? You can see it in between those two, right? So the reason for that is these interruptions, these areas without myelin are called nodes. Or the full name is node of Ranvier. Uh, obviously, the scientists put their name on it. Node of Ranvier. What is this node of Ranvier? Well, when the action potential comes in the body, like dendritis to the body, and it starts to go to the axon, if there is no myelin sheath, it will just go like this, right? Like from here to here to here to here to here. It will move down, down, down until you go all the way to here. Correct? Are we following? So you will go like, like every single spot you touch, go move, 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 until you go to the end. This is different when you have a myelin sheath. You will go here, and then you will you will find the myelin sheath, and this is insulated. It's insulated. So when you come to this, when you see it, you're going to jump over it. You jump and go to the next node. Jump to the next node. Jump to the next node. Why? Because jumping is faster than walking, right? Jumping is different than walking. Uh, a rabbit is not the same as a turtle, right? The turtle moves, touch every single spot. It goes like this, right? But the rabbit, jump, jump, jump. So it's faster. So which one, which one is faster, myelinated or unmyelinated? Myelinated. Why? Because of the jumping. You jump from here to here to here to here. You go fast. If there is nothing there, you will just walk like this. You touch every single spot. So obviously myelinated is faster. And this jumping movement is called saltatory movement. Saltatory, you will see it. This area that contain the myelin sheath, this is a node, right? The, the area interrupted here is called the node. And this is another node. In between, it's called the internode, which is the myelin. Uh, here is the axon. This is the axolemma, which is part of the Schwann cells beside it. These are the Schwann cells right here. Okay, like this. This is the nucleus, and this is the rest of the Schwann cells. So this, the whole thing. So if I ask you, if I, if I, if I put an arrow to this, the brown, can you see this? The brown. This is the nucleus of the Schwann cells. 
Anything else? It's Sichuan cells or the myelin sheath. And again, it's around the axon, like layer after layer, like this. Like if you want it, if you get something and you wrap around it several times, this is how the myelin sheath works. Now the myelin sheath. What what's the what's the the original function of the myelin sheath? It's it make the axon myelinated so the connection is faster, correct? What if you have an injury to the neuron? Here is what we always hear. Uh, if your nervous system is injured, it's gone, right? Yes, it's it's partially true, but not all the time. It all depends. If this is a neuron like this, the neuron is what? Dendritis, body, and axon, right? If you cut any axon, it's going to regenerate, which is a good thing. When the neuron die, if you cut in the body itself, okay? Because the body is still there. This is the main thing. It contains a nucleus. If it's gone, it's gone. You hear about this, like uh, injury, he got paralysis, and that's it. It's, it's gone forever. We hear about this, right? The body is gone. But if you cut the Schwann cell, uh, not the Schwann cells, I'm sorry, the axon, if they cut the axon, fortunately, the, it can heal itself. Through what? Myelin sheath first. Schwann cells make the myelin sheath, I will show you. But the Schwann cells are going to make a cover first, and then you're going to regenerate the axon. So did you ever hear about this? Like a person have cut the forearm, and actually the, the forearm is like separated, and they put it back. Did you, see, did you ever hear about this before? I've seen it before in the operating room. Like somebody coming with carrying his, his own arm, and they put it back. How? The, the nerve is cut. Yes, it's the axon that's cut. So they do, they do reconstruction surgery. Okay? They put everything back. They put the bone together. They put the muscles together. They put the blood vessels. They reconnect. And even the neuron. They put it beside each other. It's not, it's not working yet. They put it beside each other. And guess what? These Schwann cells are going to cover that area that's cut. And then it's going to regenerate inside. But what actually happened is, practically speaking, and I will show you the picture. The part of the axon that's connected to the body is still alive. The other part, peripheral, is going to die. But then the axon is going to extend and fill, fill it out again after you do the myelination. Okay? Look at this. So this is a person who's having an, an, uh, uh, an accident and it's cut here. This is the axon. Can, can it regenerate? It can, right? What's going to happen here? Do you see this? You see the blue patches here? What is this? What are these remnants? That was the axon, right? Now it's remnants. Anything before that? From here to the body, is it still okay? anything after the injury it's going to die okay so what's the first step the first step is the the macrophages are coming here to eat all these remnants why because if you wanted to rebuild you rebuild on a clean area right so you have to clean it first it will come and get all these remnants to clean it this is the first step this is called Wallerian degeneration you need to remember the name you need to remember the name Valerian degeneration. What's the Valerian degeneration? A specific type of injury to the neuron in the axon where it can regenerate. Valerian degeneration. Does it degenerate, die? Yes, the distal part only. Did you get the Valerian degeneration? Can we heal it? Valerian degeneration? Yes. First of all, the distal part, you should clean it out. Get rid of it. How? Macrophages. And then, look at the yellow. What are these cells? What do you call these cells? Schwann cells. These are the Schwann cells. See how it's rebuilding the myelin? It's rebuilding the myelin. But how about the axon? Not yet. 
the accent starts. You see how it's starting to extend in the new area that you're making? And then it will continue to regenerate until it fills the whole entire gap that was cleaned. Okay? So three steps. First step, the part of the accent distal to the injury is going to die. Macrophages will come, clean it. Now it's clean. Schwann cells will come and rebuild the, the myelin sheath. Now you have a myelin sheath, but there is nothing inside, right? Just a clean area. Axon is going to extend and fill it out. And this is uh, Wallerian degeneration. Now, the plasma cells or the, the, the neuron cells itself, do you guys remember when I talked about the action potential before? Do you guys remember this? The action potential uh, with uh, um, depolarization and repolarization? Do we still remember this? So what's happening here is, if this is the cell right like this, we know that there are ions outside, positive, and inside, same thing, right? Is it equal? It is not equal. It's negative inside compared to the outside. How did you know? Voltameter, a tiny voltameter like this, I connected like this, and like this. And read, negative. This is how we know. Negative inside compared to the outside. So is, this is the natural? Yes, this is the natural form. Uh, yeah, just sign, sign out the second. It didn't sign in. It did. Okay. Um, so this is this is called the normal, the resting state. What's the resting state? It's polarized. Negative inside compared to the outside. What do we call this? Polarized. Polarized. Polarized mean unequal. Negative inside compared to the outside. And then, if a signal comes to this resting state, it's going to disrupt what we see here. So this polarization will be taken off. We will remove it. We call that depolarization. Are we following? What's the resting? Polarization. What does it mean? Unequal. Negative inside compared to the outside. This is polarized. This is resting. This is normal. All right? If a stimulus comes, it's going to change it. This polarization will be removed. Removing is D, D-E. So we're going to depolarize until you create the electrical signal, which is called the action potential. So what do we have? We have resting membrane potential and then graded potential, which is the beginning, followed by the actual action potential. Okay, now I mentioned that it's negative inside compared to the outside, but what is... If we look at the positives, we have positives outside and positives inside. What's the positive outside? Sodium and potassium. How about the inside? Sodium and potassium. So you have it in both of them? Yes, but it's not equal. The main intracellular cation is potassium. The main extracellular is sodium. You have to remember this. Do we have sodium and potassium inside? Yes. Do we have sodium and potassium outside? Yes. What's the difference? The main inside is potassium. The main outside is sodium. You have to remember this. These are details that are very important to remember. Yes, and at the end, inside is negative compared to the outside. But you're saying collectively, if you add everything together. But details are important. Okay? So you, you do need to know the main extracellular and the main intracellular. So what's what's happening here? Uh, what, what, which side contain more potassium, inside or outside? Inside. And which side contain more sodium? Outside. If I'm telling you that there are gates and channels that's keeping it like this, 
What do you think if I open the gates for sodium? How does it move? Does it move in or out? In, because it's more outside. Clear? Concentration gradient, is that clear? Okay, how about potassium? Is it more inside or outside? Inside, and there are channels that are closed. To keep it like this, what, what if I open it? What will happen to the potassium? It goes outside, right? Is that clear? And this is actually what's going to happen when a signal come or a stimulus come. Okay, I'll give you an example. Something very simple like this, touch, and you feel it, right? You know what happened here? When I touch, there is a stimulus that goes to the membrane, open the gates, sodium moves in, followed by potassium going out. These are the changes that will happen, okay? And the details are needed, and I will tell you what we need to know. There are some numbers here that we need to know. Resting membrane potential. Uh, it, it, it's negative inside compared to the outside, right? Are we following? Okay, negative what? Negative 70. These are the numbers that you need to know. And by the way, this is like the hardest part in this chapter, the action potential. Okay, it's not easy. But I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible. Okay, but I, and I'm telling you exactly what you have to know. Uh, what's the resting condition? Uh, polarization. What do you mean? Negative inside compared to the outside. How much? Minus 70. It's minus 70. How did you know? The voltmeter told me it's minus 70, which is this. You see this? Voltmeter. So it is telling me that it is minus 70. This is resting. What if... Uh, what if a signal come, a stimulus come? This is going to be disrupted. How? I will tell you. So let's say a stimulus come to the cell. Okay? What's going to happen? When a stimulus come, the channels that I told you about, are we following? I'm, I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible. So follow with me because this is like the basics. Okay? We are talking about the normal cell. Resting condition. What's the resting condition? Polarized. What do you mean? I mean unequal. Inside and outside. Negative inside compared to the outside. How much? Minus 70. Inside to the outside. Clear so far? Okay. So what's keeping sodium outside more than inside? Channels are closed. Right? And what's keeping the, the potassium inside? The channels. Okay? Now there are two types of channels. And follow with me, I'll tell you exactly what you have to know. There are two types of channels. The main ones is what I'm talking about. It's gated. The gate is closed, and that's why it's kept like this. Okay? Sodium and potassium. However, there are another channels that are opened, but it doesn't, even though it's opened, it does not allow things to go in and out, except when a stimulus comes. So a stimulus comes. What's going to happen? The open one first is going to leak some of these ions. Clear? A signal come, a stimulus come. The very first step is the easy one. It's already opened. Anything that come, it will affect these open channels and it will leak some of these ions. So the very first thing that's going to happen is these open channels are going to leak some sodium in. Clear? Stimulus come, a signal come, the open channels, also known as leak channels, also known as ungated. It's open, meaning there are no gates, right? So it's going to leak in some sodium. And then what? How much sodium is going to, to be leaked in? It depends on the stimulus. But in all cases, some sodium will move in anyway. So what, what's going to happen now? What do you think? The polarized state, is it going to stay as it is? Of course not. S sodium, is that positive or negative? Positive. When it moves in, is the polarized state stay the same, minus 70? It needs to change, right? Change how much? I don't know. It depends. It can change like 5 
to become like, what do you think? Minus 70. Change it to 5, adding positive. What's going to be? Minus 75 or minus 65? Minus 65. Okay? What if this signal is a little bit stronger than that? More sodium moves in. Instead of moving from 70 to mi minus 70 to minus 65, it can move to mi from minus 70 to minus 60. Okay? Is there is a difference? Yes. If you hit the target, if you hit the target, the gated ones are going to open. Are we clear? If the gated ones are opened, that's it. It will stay opened until sodium moves in, moves in, moves in, moves in. Until what? Until we reach equilibrium. Where is sodium more? Outside or inside? Outside is more. When you open the gates, what will happen to the sodium? Move in, move in, move in, move in, until what? Until the suicides are equal. Why would it continue to move, right? If I have 100 outside and 20 inside, 10, 90, 30, right? Another 10, another 10. If it goes to 60 and 60, is it going to continue to move? No, you reach the equilibrium. At equilibrium, the equilibrium for sodium is positive 66, and for potassium is minus 90. Now you have three numbers. The resting and the equilibrium for both of those. Yes. It will move. This is what's going to reverse it back. But I'm just going step by step. So here is the resting. Minus 70. Inside compared to the outside. What happened? Nothing so far. Nothing happened. Equilibrium for potassium is minus 90. We will see it. Equilibrium for sodium is positive 66. We will see it. Okay, so, so far, under resting condition, sodium and potassium outside, sodium and potassium inside. Sodium is outside more than inside, potassium is more inside than outside. Okay, for this part so far? Okay, there are two types of channels, leak or open and gated channels. Open, anything can lead to these channels leaking some ions. If a stimulus come, it's going to make the leak channels leak some sodium inside. Okay? How much? Depend on the strength of that stimulus. Sodium moves in anyway. Until what? What's going to happen next? It depends. If you hit that target, the gated channels for sodium are going to open. Okay? If it open, it will continue on sodium moving in, 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 until you reach the equilibrium. Okay, and what do we call this? Depolarization. How about the first part with the leak? Depolarization. What's the difference? The first one is just leak, like sodium is moving in slowly. So we call that slow depolarization. What if you open the gates? Fast, like sodium will rush in. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going, I know I'm not going uh, slide by slide, but I'm telling you what you have to know. Okay, so uh, what do we call this? When a signal comes and the leak channels leak some sodium in, we call that graded potential.
So we have the leak channels and the gated channels. Leak and gated. Okay, the channels, there are different types of, of, uh, of these uh, channels. The one that I was talking about are the uh, mechanically gated. Like, this is the gate, right? The gate of the channel. How does it open? There are different types. Some of them will open because of the, of, of the electrical change, which is what we're talking about, right? Others can, 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 can open because of mechanical change. Others are going to, 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 to do that because of the chemical change. Here is what I mean. Here is a channel, and this is a gate. It's closed. What make it open? Several things. Some of them, what I just mentioned, which is electrical change. Did we talk about the electrical change? Changing from minus 70 to minus 60. Isn't this is a, a change in the electricity? This opened the gate. And this is the one that we're talking about right now. But there are another two types that respond to mechanical change. Example, if I push this, isn't this is a mechanical movement? Like touching and you compressing. This is a mechanical movement, right? There are some channels that are going to open because of this. How about taste? When you taste something, don't you actually realize that you tasted something? It means there is an action potential, right? How did you generate it? Chemical change. When you eat, when you taste something, there are chemicals that go to your tongue, and this is how you taste it. Okay. So there are three types. We are talking about the the elect the voltage gated ones, but you need to know that there are another two types. Okay, mechanical and chemical. Okay, but we are sticking with the voltage one. Chemically gated. This is something that will open because of change in the chemicals, okay? Like acetylcholine, for example. Do we remember this? Do you guys remember when the vesicles containing acetylcholine released, cross the gap, go to the other side? Do you remember this? And then you create action potential in the post synapse. Do you remember this? What is the reason for creating the action potential in the, in the muscles? It, it, wasn't it the acetylcholine? going attaching to the receptors acetylcholine is a chemical isn't it and what make the channels open here it's acetylcholine so this is chemically gated taste this is chemically gated uh if electrical signal come like the one that we're talking about electrically gated or voltage gated Mechanically gated is the last one, like touch or pressure. Here is the uh, acetylcholine. Um, I, I don't really need the details. What I, what, I, what I want you to know is what are the chemically gated channels? Channels that can open the gates because change in the chemistry. Example, acetylcholine or taste. It, it's it's one of the things that, that 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 can be that can result from that. It's not it's not pain because of of this change alone, but uh, it, it the pain follow the same way. So chemically gated, a chemical come open the gates. Voltage gated, voltage change opening the gates. You see this change. This is the one that I was talking about. Look at this, minus seventy to minus sixty. You hit that you triggered, you hit. If you move to minus 60, they open. Uh, do you want us to, to remember this number too? Yes. What's the resting membrane potential? Minus 70. What is the threshold for these gates? Minus 60. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, what, what if a change that caused to move from minus 70 to minus 68? What do you think will happen? Nothing. Nothing. Like something that's very minor, a little bit of sodium moved in, changing it from minus 70. Hmm? 
uh, the leak channels, yes, the, the leak channel will make that minor change. Okay, anything that come, are we following? Anything that come will affect the leak channels. Okay, resulting in depolarization. How much? This is this what will make the difference. So what's the first thing? Uh, if it moves from minus 70 to minus 68, nothing. The gated channels will not open before you get to the magic number. What's the magic number? Minus 60. This is the only way. How about uh, you go down to minus 65? Nothing. Only if you go enough, if the signal is strong enough so that you get to the minus 60, this is our magic number and the gate will open. So when the gate opened for sodium, minus 60. What do we call it? Threshold. The threshold for sodium channels. You have to get into the threshold. If you reach the threshold, they will open. You don't reach the threshold, nothing is going to happen. And by the way, we call this all or none. Uh, my, minus 70 to minus 68. No, minus 68. None. Nothing. How about uh, minus 66? Nothing. None. Minus uh, 62. Uh, none. Minus 60. Yes. All. All or none. Either the signal is strong enough to get it to minus 60 or nothing is going to happen. Are we following? How about for, for, for uh, potassium? Positive 30. Write these numbers because I will ask you about it. Resting potential minus 70. Threshold minus for sodium minus 60. Threshold for potassium positive 30. 30. Equilibrium, 66 and 90. Graded potential is the minor change that happened because of the open or the leak channels. It will lead to a little bit of uh, depolarization. This is minus 70. Look at this. Minor change happened, minus 65. My, not enough. How about if it's minus 60? Yes. Now the gated channels will open. And you're going to start the actual depolarization. What will happen after the depolarization? Depolarization, meaning you lost the polarization, right? Uh, are, you, are you ever going back to the resting state? Of course. Repolarization. You are going to polarize again. So let me do it like this. The, this curve is extremely, extremely important, and I'm telling you, I, I will give you a graph in the exam. Okay? So this is what's happening. This is minus 70. What is this? Rest. Similar sum, whatever the similar is. You touch something, whatever happens. Okay? Leak channels are going to leak some sodium ion. So if this is minus uh, 70, minus 60, minus 30, minus 20, uh, zero, positive 10, positive 20, and so on. So they move up or down. And the leak channel, sodium started to go in. Move up. Yes, this is the leak channel. But it is not moving like this. Because the leak channels are just really a little bit. So this is slow depolarization. Until what? Until you reach the end. If you reach it, what do you think will happen to you? Which channel? You go up like this. This is slow, and this is fast. Slow and fast what? Deep polarization. All details are important. You can ask me, what is this? 
Let's say, suppose, how much I was serving you? One is here. The age is potential or a failure? The age is potential. This and what is this part of, of the curve? Slow depolarization. Uh, what else? What is open channel, loose channel, moving slowly and end? Is that clear? What exactly changed you at this point? Why did it change from slow to fast? Yes, so you need to test me and you open the gate for sodium, right? This will be followed by fast depolarization, okay? And then what? Here sodium moves in slowly and a little bit. Here sodium is moving in, 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 in. And then what? Until you reach the equilibrium for sodium, okay? Equilibrium of sodium, uh, pulse is 66, okay? Now, what's going to happen here? If you reach, uh, what was the thing you want to say? Pulse is 30, what do you think will happen here? What will open at this? Yes, but what will, will open this thing? What is that? Potassium will open. So potassium moves in or out? No. Where is the potassium more? In or out? In. When you open the gate for them, what happens? You move out. Repolarization. Did you get that? Did you understand that? Potassium moves out. What happens to the inside? Become negative or positive? Positive is po potassium is positive and it's leaving. Sure. It comes negative, right? You're returning back to the negative. You stop the negative, switch, and then you're coming back. So potassium will open, potassium will move out, move out, move out, and you're, po you're causing a change of thing. Back or again? Repolarization. Uh, so, yes. You are going to go all the way to minus 70, right? No, you're going to exceed it. You won't, you won't stop here. You go to minus 90. Why is this happening like this? Because this is when the, the potassium channels were closed. And then you're going to go back to the original channel. Did you get this? You will see this curve in your exam. Okay? This is like the most important part of the whole thing. Besides the new R. One more time. Here it is. Resting potential minus 70. Nothing is happening. Resting. We are in a state of polarization. Negative in inside compared to the outside. Clear? Okay. What's more inside? Potassium. What's more outside? Sodium. The latest potential happened here. The latest potential right here. It, count it come here. What will happen? Open channels and loose channels. Loose with so uh, potassium. Uh, liquid sodium and slow depolarization. Uh, what's the explanation for the sl slow depolarization? Open channels looping. Not yet. Not the gradient. Lo leak channel is leaking what? Sodium only. Sodium only. Until you reach this point. What is this point? Threshold for gated sodium channel. And then what happens? Fast depolarization. What's what's happening here? Why is it fast? What opens? Gated. The gated channels open. Are you going to go forever? No. At this point here, the potassium plus is 30, potassium will open. It's going to reverse it. So now you're going to repolarization. If I ask you, what is this? Repolarization. What's the explanation? Gated potassium. Okay? Are you going to go down all the way until you reach the minus 70? No, I will exceed it. And what do you call this? Hyperpolarization. You don't just go back to the polarization, to the minus 70. You actually exceed it. Yes. It always, it doesn't just go back. It goes all the way. Do you, know, do you guys know these doors in the bar when you like open it? And when you let it go, it doesn't go like, like here. It goes like beyond it. And then go like this and stop, right? 
it, ha it has to exceed and then one more that. Is that clear so far? So did, did we, yeah. Uh, no, uh, positive 30 is when the potassium opens. When the potassium opens, that's it. It has to be reversed. Okay? So what will happen after that? It will go back to normal. Are we back to normal now? Yes. Minus 70, isn't it? So from the electrical point of view, we are back to normal. But guess what? Didn't you reverse a little bit of potassium now? Are we, are we following? Point, yeah. We reach minus 70 again. But how about the chemical point? No, we do not. We, we, we split. Okay? So we're not going to keep it like this. But what are you going to do? I'm going to put it back. How? There are carriers like this that will move potassium and going back and will move sodium out again. Isn't that going back to the original condition? So we go to the original scatter in two steps. We go electrically first. When we do that, when we go back, when we reverse, we're going back to minus 70. So we're good. Uh, yes, we're good from the electrical point. But the chemical, no. We reverse. And it's not supposed to stay like this. So what are you going to do? To do? I'm going to use something called sodium-potassium ATP. Sodium-potassium, what does it mean? Sodium potassium means it's going to exchange sodium for potassium. Clear? Sodium for potassium. And what's ATPase? ATPase is an enzyme that breaks down ATP because we need energy to do this process. Why do you need to why do you need energy? Because you're putting potassium back in and inside it's already a lot. And you're still pushing it. Again, it's it's concentration gradient. So sodium potassium ATP will return potassium back in. Again, it's, it's gradient. You're pushing it in, and, but the potassium is more inside. Still pushing in, using energy. Did you, did you get what I mean? Moving across concentration gradient is always passive. Against is always active. Clear? So you're moving now against concentration gradient. Mo pushing potassium in. Uh, potassium is more inside now. Still pushing in. It's increasing in size. Still pushing in against it. That means energy, right? Sodium, potassium, ATP. But they notice something that's interesting, that for every two potassium, you move in, you move three sodium. You need to remember that. The percentage is 2%. If you, you don't have to know. But if you wanted to know, because of this. Look at this here. We found that it looks like this on one side, and for sodium it looks like this. Look at that. This can fetch how many? Potassium? Two. And this can fetch three. When you rotate, if you rotate it, potassium will move out and sodium will move in. But uh, how many sodium and how many potassium? Two to three. Four to six, and you do the math, okay? 200, 300, 400, 600, it's a ratio. So I go like this. One end, potassium two, and the other end, sodium three. I go like this. I keep on doing this. Two versus three. Two versus three. You don't need to know the explanation or the details more than that, but you do have to remember that what's doing this is called sodium potassium ATP because it gives ATP, because you're going against the concentration gradient, and it goes two to three. Why do you go two to three? This is the configuration. This is how it's configured. This is what it is. This carrier can go two and three. Okay? So I'm going to stop here. And...